welcome to the show. <laughs> well, thanks. I appreciate that. And nice to talk to you and see you in Wales. It is great to welcome you. You know, from- I was supposed to I was supposed to go to Wales uh last spring for Giving the Devil His Due. It was published by Cambridge University Press. They had a whole uh trip planned for the UK and you know, we got coveted out of business, I'm afraid. Like well, if, everybody else. <laughs> if you ever get coveted back into business, I would most certainly welcome you here. <laughs> well, we were actually talking about coming uh, for the paperback edition, like uh, in another six months, but I'm not at all sure we're going to be out of the clear in six months. Maybe a year from now, I think we'll be okay. Amazing. It sounds, sounds fantastic. So I'd love to kick this podcast off. I've been doing a, a uh, deep dive of Dr. Michael Schumer, and I'd love to ask you. Is there anything that you agree with Deepak Chopra on? <laughs> oh, well, um, yeah, our fundamental worldview differences are pretty substantial. That is to say, he's a um, consciousness or spiritual monist, and I'm a materialist monist. That is to say, he's not a dualist in the traditional sense where he thinks uh, consciousness kind of floats off the brain and exists out there somewhere after you die or whatever. Um, he thinks everything is consciousness and that material stuff, this microphone, me, you, your headphones, the bookcase behind you, everything is conscious to some degree. And, you know, there I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of that. I think it's far more likely, I think it's too broad a definition of consciousness, um, you know, I, I think the idea of self-awareness and sentience and, you know, uh, uh, the ability to feel and, uh, and suffer and so on that, you know, a, a, th- there's degrees of that, obviously, in the animal kingdom. But, you know, once you get down to, you know, my socks are conscious or something, you know, it's like <laughs> kind of loses all meaning. So there's that um, fundamental difference, I'd say, in terms of similarities. Um, I, I do like his kind of holistic approach to health. You know, I think the traditional medical model of breaking things down and, and isolating particular medical problems, as successful as that has been, it, it's good. Uh, I like Deepak's idea of, you know, integrating uh, physical health, mental health, um, you know, yoga, stretching, meditation, exercise, diet. I do think all those things matter. And uh, I do think modern medicine is kind of catching up with that idea. Um, so, I, I, you know, and, and finally, I, I, I do appreciate his friendship. He's a good guy. He's not a fraud, a scamster. He's, uh, you know, he's not just trying to con people out of money. Uh, he really believes what he says he, he believes. And uh, he really thinks he's doing good work and helping people. And I think he, I, I believe that. I think that's true. And, you know, I, I wish I did more of that. You know, I'm kind of in the realm of ideas. And, uh, you know, he has more hands-on practitioner type effects on people. And, you know, he has a massive following. That's not to say that cult leaders don't have massive followings or whatever. But, you know, I've met a lot of his followers and they, you know, they, they, they do seem to genuinely get something out of his worldview and his approach. You know, he's, uh, you know, he's also, as far as I could tell, a pretty moral guy. I mean, he's like many gurus, unlike most gurus, you know, he doesn't sleep with all his, his clients and patients or whatever. <laughs> and he doesn't, you know, try to exploit them for massive amounts of money and get them to bankrupt their, um, their house or, you know, take a second mortgage or whatever, like Scientology does or this Nexium latest cult. And Deepak's nothing like that. So, Oh, oh, sorry. Not sure okay. we had a, a bit of a lag. Yeah, break. we had a we had a yeah. little internet. Uh, yeah, okay. it's all right. <laughs> the joys of Zoom, <laughs> but yeah, but I, I think um, what one thing I would say on on you know you and uh, Deepak is that what I particularly enjoy is the whatever side of this sort of fence where someone wants to you know hedge towards more of a scientific sort of skeptical approach, or whether they want to you know sort of edge towards Deepak that, you know, socks have consciousness and whatever. I, I love that you two guys sit down and have a, a rational conversation. I, I think that that is so sorely missed today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you have to talk across the aisle, as they say. Um, the problem of being isolated in a bubble, as, as we've recognized from social media in the last few years, is that you wouldn't know if you're wrong about something unless you talk to somebody who disagrees with you and points out the flaws in your thinking or counter evidence or 
different perspectives on how to look at things. And uh, that's super important. It's, you know, it's the core of science. Science, it's the, there's no method per se that, you know, you could list out, you know, six points or whatever. It's a very social process and we reach consensus in science through this constant uh, disputation, debate, open dialogue, open peer review and commentary and, and, you know, critical analysis by other people because no one's omniscient, you know, no one knows everything. And so, you know, we're all subject to potential bias. And so the only way to know if you've gone off the rails down some pathway that's going to lead to nowhere is to talk to people that disagree with you, you know, that, that don't work in your lab or, or don't work for you or not your graduate students. People have no vested interest in supporting what you believe and, and, and are willing to point out, and it's important that you make it clear, you're open to criticism. If you're not, people are going to be uh, reticent to say anything that's critical. So you have to, you know, cultivate that kind of spirit of science of, you know, openness to criticism and, you know, counterfactual thought experiments or counter data that goes against your hypotheses. You have to be open to that or else um, you're going to possibly be deluded. I love that. I love that. And uh, speaking of the sort of spirit of science and whatnot, you put out a tweet a couple of days ago, which I was very fond of. And you said, what is the world's most expensive streaming service? <laughs> College. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and uh, I love this one. So I'd love to, to sort of put it there. So we recently had uh, Brett Weinstein on the show and, oh, he, de- and right. he described um, university college these days as a, as a racket. So I would love to sort of get your thoughts on um, the university system, um, the sort of syllabus, the sort of way it's taught. Um, and then even perhaps, you know, I mean, Jonathan Haidt wrote a great book on this of sort of these sort of political issues within a university. So it's sort of a big question, but I'd love to sort of know your thoughts on just the sort of university system as a whole in, in today's age. Yeah, uh, I'd say racket is too strong a word. It's certainly... Uh, it's not a racket like like a pyramid scheme or you know something like this. Uh, more like bureaucratic fiefdoms where different departments compete for uh, budgetary dollars, and you know they all try to uh, emphasize the value of their department. They all want to hire more people, more professors in their department, or get more administrative um, staff support and so forth. That's but that's true in any company, any government agency, everybody acts like that. So that's not a racket. That's kind of business as usual. I think the the problem has been this um, increase in tuition relative to other goods and services. So if you have a basket of goods, you know, a quart of milk, a gallon of gas, a loaf of bread, so forth, uh, and, and you just track their price increases over, say, 50 years, uh, and adjusting for inflation and so forth, you you see that they all go up a little bit, but you know college tuition goes way way up, and so there's debates about why this is, but w- part of it is that um, the the ratio of professors to students hasn't changed all that much. What has changed is the ratio of administrators to professors or administrators to students, and that's gone way up, and that's expensive. I mean the most the the biggest chunk of any organization's budget is payroll. So the more people you hire to do whatever, uh, that's expensive, not just, the, you know, whatever you're paying them, but also their health care, retirement uh, programs and, and uh, withholding taxes and so forth. That's, that's a lot. So I think um, that plus the, the kind of plushiness of colleges and universities now with, you know, gyms and climbing walls and, and uh, you know, these really, really nice uh, buildings that these students hang out at. Uh, you know, this is, it, it's not Spartan like it used to be when I was in college in the 70s. Uh, they're like country clubs now, you know, like a club med, like a, you know, like the gyms are, you know, spectacular. I mean, these gyms are are like the best private gym I've ever seen. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I think that costs money. So, and then you also have the competition uh, because since the second world war, you know, the percentage of Americans going to college has been going up and up and up. Well, that's kind of finally plateaued now that the baby boomers babies 
are you know at, through college and you know the the the, the demographics are going to shift and there's going to be fewer students entering college in the next couple of decades consistently so that's going to drive the the you know competition up uh, for among colleges for students to keep up that momentum of of uh, demand and uh, and then, of course, uh, then there's the, you know, the COVID crisis here that's kind of exposed the underbelly of, of what exactly you're paying for. And um, uh, if you can get all this stuff online, you know, essentially streaming your professor giving a lecture, um, you know, what, what are you really paying for? Um, well, you're paying for all the extra stuff, you know, the dorms and the meals and the gyms and all the administrators that are protecting you and, 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 and so forth or whatever it is they're doing. You know, that, that I think um, uh, I'm projecting that in the coming years, uh, the colleges and universities that were on the margin already barely hanging on, uh, even with everything going for them. Uh, I think a lot of them will go out of business. And uh, I mean, that's true for, for all retail stores. I mean, theaters are closing uh, right and left. I, uh, a friend of mine owns a huge theater here on, in LA and it's a Regal, which is one of the two or three biggest uh, theater uh, renters, you know, film, film distributors. And so they rent these theaters. I mean, my friend was getting $100,000 a month renting his theater to Regal. And, uh, and they just stopped paying them. They just, back in March, they said, we, we, we don't have any money. <laughs> you know, there's no more income. There's no more, no one's going to theaters anymore. So we can't pay you. So he had to call his bank and go, I can't pay you because my guy's not paying me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just, that just trickles down, just multiply that by a million or whatever. And that's, you know, the state of the economy. Well, some of that will come back, of course, um, restaurants and bars and nail salons and, and gyms and so on. All, all that came back. Now it's being closed, but that'll I'll come back. But I do think there's a lot of industries that will not recover. Theaters might be one. A lot of colleges and universities that were not particularly solvent already, they, they may never uh, reopen. Now, of course, the Harvards and Stanfords and MITs and so on, the ones with big endowments, they'll be fine. Uh, but, but I do think it's a legitimate question to ask, what are we getting for $50,000, $60,000 a year? Uh, you know, there's, and also it's opening up the market for private uh, sources of education. Uh, you know, I'm a longtime consumer of teaching company courses, the so-called great courses, you know, audible.com, audiobooks, uh, MOOC courses, you know, massive online uh, uh, courses that you could get through MIT and Stanford and others, uh, Berkeley, and, and so on. These, these are really, it's never been a better time to be an autodidact you can educate yourself pretty much for free. Now, it's not the same as being in a classroom, I know. And, uh, you know, even, of course, laboratory classes or whatever, it's hard to do that online. But even, you know, just like a small seminar of 20 students, like I had at Chapman University, you know, doesn't exist anymore because they're all done by Zoom now online. And I did that last semester, and it's just next to impossible to have an interesting conversation where the conversation kind of ricochets around the room, people looking at each other, picking up nonverbal cues. When can I say something? Yeah. Does the professor want me to say something? Is he about to say something? You can't tell any of that on Zoom. And so uh, I think a lot of students that are maybe taking this year off, I do, I, I know some at Ch Chapman, they're just taking the year off. Maybe they won't come back. Maybe they say, well, the hell with it. I'll just, I'll just purchase, you know, 50 courses uh, of the great courses. I can take, you know, all of the classes I'm taking at whatever university for a fraction of the cost. And these are taught by the best professors in that field from every uh, university around the world professionally produced in a studio and uh you know so you, there, there's no hit and miss about the quality the quality is fantastic and so it's really just the knowledge and um again i i think college is not going to go away for sure but i i think there'll be some improvements on you know online education and i i think there's a great future there for entrepreneurs to get in on that yeah and, and on that point i mean it's very similar to what you said i mean uh brett when he came on the show he said that for the person with say the right motivational makeup, they could go out and teach themselves, say something like coding online and say perhaps one of those courses, which, which you sort of recommended. I'd, I'd love to ask you on this point, if you were sort of given the keys to the kingdom and you could make some <laughs> sort of 
wide scale uh, educational reform to the university system, what would be some sort of changes that you would make as a, as a whole? Yeah, I, I, I would say, um, you know, smaller classes with more interactions with professors. Obviously, that's easy at a small liberal arts college where I teach at Chapman University, but uh, you know, harder to do at a UCLA with 30,000 students or whatever. That would require hiring more professors and instructors, graduate students, and so on to do that more one-on-one -on -one or, you know, one-on-20 small group uh, discussions that really can't be replaced by uh, online education. You know, that kind of in the in the classroom conversations. And here I'm not even talking about lab classes for sciences or something like that. I just mean, you know, kind of a liberal arts education of learning how to think. Uh, you know, I just hire more of those people, hire less diversity administrators and deans, whatever it is they do, walk around campus looking for trouble, uh, you know, where we can, you know, the most liberal tolerant, you know, institutions on the planet, you know, have hired these people to go around and look for discrimination. I mean, come on. Uh, you know, how much is there really? What, what, what are you doing? I mean, wouldn't the students be better served by hiring more educational, you know, experts in different fields? Um, I also would emphasize more uh, teaching critical thinking. Now, everybody says that's what they've been doing for decades. But I mean, really thinking like a scientist. That's why I labeled my course Skepticism 101, how to think like a scientist. Here, I, I don't mean uh, the rules of logic and, 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 and rationality and all that, which is good. Uh, but I mean, just how to think, how do scientists think, you know, how does that consensus thing work anyway? And, uh, you know, how do we arrive at truth? What is truth anyway? And yes, that you could take an epistemology course, but, uh, but I, I think a, a more pragmatic approach to dealing with questions that are, you know, on the table now, like climate change and vaccines, uh, you know, evolution, uh, GMOs, nuclear power, you know, how should we think about these things in terms of what's really true about them and then policy uh, recommendations based on what we think is true about them. And, and even that, that's not just, well, you, you have your politics, I have mine, and, and we can't find agreement on what's the right path to go. Yes, we can. I think we can. And there's, you know, a way to think about that scientifically that I think I would have uh, have more classes like that. I love that answer. And I want to jump into um, the basis of forming beliefs and whatnot, and we'll delve through your book. I just got one last question for you on sort of the college and the sort of education uh, current setup. And that was very recently I saw AOC come out and sort of make this thing about canceling student debt. Uh, I saw, oh, I saw you tweeted yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. What? What, do you have any well, thoughts I mean, on that? <laughs> yeah, my general thought on that, of, of course, debt is, is, is a choice uh, for, for most people. And, um, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, most of corporate, um, not just America, but around the world is, you know, is mired in debt. You couldn't get a corporation going without debt. Uh, and, you know, you know, just how much debt you're retaining, how much debt the bank holds and so on. That's all part of normal business. Um, what what AOC and the and the cancel the debt people are talking about is it just seems inordinately amount of debt. Well, you know, at some point the students and their parents made a choice. They know uh, what the uh, what the interest rates are. You can see what the payments are going to be. That you know before you even sign on the dotted line, uh, tell you this is what the monthly is going to be, and it's going to take you you know thirty years to pay it off, and we're going to make three times what the original loan was. And you go, well, okay, I guess I'm gonna do it anyway. That's a, a volitional choice. I, I think what bothers me about the, you know, cancel the debt people is, is, is a couple of things. Is the assumption that people don't have free will, that they're, they're not volitional beings. They're, you know, kind of forced by the system into having to have a college education uh, and, and go to this expensive four year uh, college and spend $250,000 or whatever. Uh, none of this is true. I mean, you don't have to go to college. Uh, you, first of all, you don't have to go to a four-year expensive elite college. You can go to community college. When I went, I went my first two years to a community college. It's free at the time in the 70s. It, it costs now, but, you know, it's super cheap. And, uh, and, and you get the best, you get as good an education 
at a community college as anywhere else in, in terms of the quality of the professors and the teaching. And what you're taking your first two years is just GE anyway, general education stuff. You know, you can take calculus or chemistry or intro psych or intro geology or whatever from anybody. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, a top geologist at Harvard or UCLA. And in, and in, in any case, in most of those examples, you're not getting that professor you're getting his graduate students. Uh, maybe he shows up and gives a few lectures, but he, you know, his, he's paid to do research, not teach. And uh, teachers at community colleges, they're, they're paid to teach. They're, they're not even really supposed to be doing research. If they do, they do it on their own time and their own dime, they're not paid for that. So why not do that? And then go to a state college or state university. Again, super cheap relative to the privates. And uh, even though the, the, the big state systems like the University of California system, UCLA, for example, they've gotten a lot more expensive, they're still way cheaper uh, than private colleges. I mean, most of the cost you see, and maybe they cost 25, 30,000 a year, most of that's room and board. Well, you have to, leave, you have to eat and live somewhere anyway. So that, that's not a, a, a you know, kind of an add-on unfair cost that, that you're going to, wherever you, whatever you do in life, you're going to have to eat and live somewhere. So you're going to be paying for that anyway. Uh, so, and then finally, you don't have to go to college. I mean, there's lots of ways to be successful and happy and fulfilled in life uh, without going to college. You know, there's always been that assumption, you know, you got to go to college. And I think college is great. I'm a college professor. I have a PhD. I went to college. I, I got a lot out of it. But I meet lots of people that that never went that path and they are you know they're rich or they're successful they're happy they're fulfilled they have great lives <laughs> so there's no there's no uh there's no law, law of nature that says you got to do that or law of, of uh, politics or society um you know so that that that's my take on that i love it man i love it so i devoured this book very recently i think this is the perhaps the third of your books that i've gone through I, I believe the third, I, I really, really enjoyed this one. Um, oh, thank you. I, I, so I look at your work and you've sort of looked at how people form beliefs into UFOs and Bigfoot and Holocaust denialism and uh, all these, these other crazy things. So I would love to turn this to sort of your work and, and beliefs and say, you know, what are some of the cognitive distortions or perhaps reasons why, you know, people would believe in, say, something like conspiracy theories? Mm. Yeah, well, first of all, um, you know, the general principle or problem here is motivated reasoning, namely that we're motivated to reason our way to finding evidence for what we already believe for other reasons. What are those other reasons? Well, you know, political commitments or religious faith commitments, uh, economic ideologies, and, and so forth that we hold for whatever reason. We are raised that way, or this is the, the influence of our peer groups or our teachers. Uh, it's emotionally satisfying to be a conservative or a liberal or whatever. And then, you know, we back into it, the thesis of the believing brain, we back into it with evidence after the fact. And now, if you ask somebody, why are you a conservative or why are you a liberal? They don't say, well, it just feels good or that's what my parents believed or my friends are all liberals or whatever. Of course, they don't say that. No one thinks that that's what's going on, but that is what's going on. And uh, and, and so, you know, the the first principle then is is you have to be aware of that. <laughs> and maybe you're right. It's possible. Maybe that that's the right position to take. But clearly when there's, you know, a, a division in a population about what's the right thing to do what's the right tax right let's say do we have a flat tax or a progressive tax or a regressive tax you know there's not a correct answer like you would find in chemistry or physics or something like that yeah. uh, in the same way and so you have to acknowledge that um, you know this is sort of a debatable point this is my position you have your position let's see if we can find some common ground something like that now the conspiracy theories um you know, these, these tend to be kind of overly simplified explanations for usually messy, complex social phenomenon related to power, you know, who has power, who doesn't, who's in power, who's out of power, you know, politically, for example, usually the conspiracists are those that lost the election or they think they're going to lose the election. And the people that are in power, they usually normally drop the conspiracists 
conspiracism. Trump was a, a, a was an outlier in that regard. You know, after he won, he continued with the conspiracist theories. <laughs> it's like, dude, you won. You don't have. You can drop them now. <laughs> and of course, you know, now we're in the middle of you know a second round of conspiracy theories in that regard. And uh, but to what extent did they influence people? That's hard to say. Uh, this is a debatable point. Uh, you know, of course, I make my living debunking bad ideas because I think uh, we should have good ideas that is grounded in evidence and reason and so forth. But it's not clear that that debunking crazy conspiracy theories causes people to change their minds about their, say, fundamental political position. Uh, so my favorite example of this is the Pizzagate conspiracy theory that you know Hillary Clinton and uh, you know a, a bunch of celebrities were running this pedophile ring, the satanic pedophile ring, out of a pizzeria, and you know this was you know on the cusp of the 2016 election, and after that is where QAnon took off that whole conspiracy theory, and uh, but you know these are people that mostly hate Hillary Clinton, so it's not like um, okay, hang on for a second, I gotta weirdo. Uh, okay, there we go. Something just popped up on my screen. Uh, it's not like if I debunked uh, the pedophile ring conspiracy theory that people are going to go, oh, okay, in that case, I'll vote for Hillary. No, they were never going to vote for Hillary anyway. Mm. So much of this is just reinforcing uh, what we already believe, which is where I started this answer. So um, you know, liberals are committed to liberal principles and conservatives to conservative principles for whatever reason. And then after the fact, they find things to support it. So changing some little factoid over here is not likely to change somebody's core beliefs. Um, so, uh, and so other examples I give on this, like if you are a born again Christian and you're not sure about the theory of evolution, and I present it in a way that you have to give up Jesus and accept Darwin as your savior, whatever. You know, this isn't going to happen. You can't, you can't couch it in that kind of choice. Uh, better you should start off and say, look, you can keep your religion. You know, you, I think there is a conflict between science and religion in most areas, but I, I would not approach it that way. I would just say, look, you have your religious beliefs, those are separate from scientific beliefs. Maybe evolution is the way God created diversity of life in the same way that he used gravity to create solar systems or whatever. Just accept the laws of nature, accept natural science for what it finds and, and keep your beliefs. Because if you tell people that they have to give up those beliefs, they're not going to do it. Same thing with climate change. Um, you know, most conservatives are not anti-science across the board. They're anti-science on climate. Uh, and why is that? Well, because, you know, they hold beliefs about the economy and free markets and so on. They feel like that's if that's true, then that has policy implications for reducing carbon emissions. And therefore, they're going to curtail capitalism and free markets. Therefore, I have to be against it. And it didn't help that Al Gore's, um, you know, Inconvenient Truth, you know, became so famous and won, I don't know, Academy Award, Emmy Award, whatever. It won a bunch of awards. And then that, so then climate science became affiliated with a liberal left wing um, position or movement. So conservatives just knee jerk are against it. And it's not like liberals know more about climate science. Uh, knowledge of climate science is not a very good predictor of your position on climate science. What is a good predictor is your political beliefs. Well, what does that got to do with carbon emissions or CO2 gases? Nothing, but it, it's, it, it, it's a, a signal of your commitment to your political party, your position. You know, I am so in favor of free markets. I am willing to doubt the validity of climate science. And, uh, you know, it's, you pick, pick your example, um, you know, the, and the left has their own, they're anti GMOs, they're anti nuclear, because it's not natural and so on. And, you know, they're just as bad about science as conservatives are in certain areas. Uh, like the blank slate model of human nature, liberals are tend to be more skeptical of that than conservatives. And I, I think that again, is a signal of their commitment to certain values that are not grounded in science. They're, they're, they're beyond science or meta science or, 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 or they're just morals or whatever. And, uh, and so again, approaching them by telling them you have to give up your core beliefs, they're, they're not gonna do it anyway. 
I love that answer. And I love the example you gave of uh, choosing between Jesus and Darwin. You know, I mean, I think if I had to choose between, say, Jesus and Gadsad, I think I would become a Christian. <laughs> I'm joking. I love Gadsad. He's been on the show. But, uh, oh, poor Gad. <laughs> poor Gad. <laughs> but, yeah. He's the savior. <laughs> He's the savior. <laughs> but yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love to ask you, um, what are some of the healthy ways to form a belief? Well, obviously, ideally, you would just kind of approach the facts neutrally. That's not possible because we all approach facts with some kind of worldview already in mind. Um, so, you know, short of that, then it's, it's, again, this kind of idea of epistemic humility that is always approach something. You know what? I could be wrong. This is what I believe now. I'm pretty confident. I could be wrong. You know, just just those that, that, that little phrase at the end there. I could be wrong. Uh, you know, it just makes it possible for you to listen to somebody else. And of course, that does make people feel like um, you respect them, you're listening to them. Uh, and, you know, here I have a whole list of things you can do uh, when you're talking to somebody, which are sim- similar to Rappaport's rules of debate, you know, just you know, repeat the other person's position in, in such a way that they agree. That is what I'm arguing. That's actually harder to do than it sounds. Uh, one, um, you're not always listening carefully. Uh, perhaps you're waiting for them to shut up so you can make your point. <laughs> Most of us do this. Uh, so don't do that. You know, just listen to what they have to say carefully enough that, and then repeat in your own words what you think they're arguing. Let me get this straight. Are you saying boom, boom, boom? Mm-hmm. Now, often they'll go, well, no, no, actually, that's not what I'm saying. Now, maybe you misinterpreted it, or maybe once they heard how it sounds, they think, oh, that doesn't sound very logical. Let me come at it a different way. And they, they rephrase their own position. And, uh, and so that approach gets you to, um, A, get the other person to respect you, listen to you because you're listening to them, you're respecting them. And also find some common ground of how are you going to determine what the right answer is? You know, let's, let's find some agreement that we can have here on how we end the conversation. That is, how, how do we decide who's right? Or maybe we just end up saying, you know, but that we're going to agree to disagree and leave it at that. That's always also a possibility. I would love to ask you on this point. So we've sort of touched on um, a, you know, a sort of scientific humility. Um, at the beginning, we touched on, you know, statistics and, you know, sort of probabilistic thinking and forming hypotheses and whatnot. Um, but I would love to ask you um, about the sort of power of creating beliefs which may not in fact be true but they may lead to a power uh, a positive example so for instance i think of something like a placebo drug or perhaps pascal's wager or uh you know i'm sure that grandiose people perhaps make more money if they believe that they're better at their jobs than other people so i wonder mm. is there a, a mm. view or sorry is there a place in your view for perhaps these types of fake it till you make it beliefs <laughs> yeah i see where you're going with that uh it, it's an important point i mean placebo is a real effect um the power of belief is you know of course what uh, you know m- many of my books are about um but the question is is it really leading you to truth that is mm-hmm. is that the right position to take um separate from does it work or not of course placebos could work uh but you got to believe them even if the substance is is inert um you you know and then then you have the kind of the ethics of you know lying to people or just say well i i'm going to tell them it works because maybe that'll have the effect that i want okay you know that's that's at least a debatable ethically debatable uh position to take um in some areas, like say the self-help movement, the fake it till you make it, some of that is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, you're required to have a certain level of risk-taking, say in business, if you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, you're going to fail a lot. So you have to get used to that and just keep pushing through and keep telling yourself, I can do it, I can do it. And at some point you do. If you didn't do that, you'd stop early and maybe you never, you know, you never have the big breakthrough. So there's some of that that's true. Um, you know, we've done research on the self-help movement, and um, you know, the number one predictor of who will buy a self-help book is is people that have already bought 
self-help books. Um, well, if, if they really worked, why do you need to keep buying new ones? And, <laughs> and the answer is because they don't, they don't really work in some like medical model. Well, here, take this and this will do X. Uh, it's that it's kind of a constant process of getting up in the morning and telling yourself, okay, I'm going to get out there. I'm going to just do this. And you got to do this every day or else you're not going to be successful. So, so some of that is that's true. You know, you have to just kind of keep, keep pushing along. I wouldn't call that fate. Um, that's a little different than fate. It's, you know, confidence that if I keep trying, it'll eventually work or, or something like that. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, religion's a little bit different in that regard. Although there are, you know, some theologians that, that, that argue um, that faith has value in the sense that there are certain things you can't prove or disprove. So if it works for you, it's kind of this pragmatism theory of truth, then it's true. It's true for you. So, you know, while I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist. I believe in the God that ex the gods that exist in people's heads. Those gods are very real and they act on those. And I should assume those gods are, are, are really there in those people's heads. That's, I think that's kind of what you're getting at there. And um, I think, you know, in a meta way, we should acknowledge those truths, <laughs> true for that person. And they will act on that truth in a way that's, that's demonstrably important, like flying planes into buildings or blowing up abortion clinics or whatever it is. Um, you know, they're acting in a way that is true for them. And uh, so there, there it matters. Uh, th and therefore, I would push in one final point here. What's really true is, is what matters. Because if, if the, in the long run, we can talk uh, suicide bombers out of acting the way that they do because we show that they were wrong in the first place. The Quran doesn't say this is what you should do. Oh, okay. And for that, you need, you know, the moderate Muslim leaders that, you know, to, to curtail those extreme uh, activities, that kind of thing. That's a really great answer. Um, I'd love to touch on um, given his devil is due um, because I felt as if, you know, when I went through that book, you made a real um, call to reason, I would say a sort of ardent defense of um, free speech, you know, my sort of interpretation on it, please feel free to fact check me was that, you know, you make the case that freedom of speech is, sort of necessary for a healthy and sort of thriving society. So I would love to sort of get your view on sort of uh, where are we at with freedom of speech in sort of today's world and perhaps why is it so important? Yeah, so, and this gets back to where we started that, you know, no, none of us are omniscient, so you have to talk to other people. Hmm. Well, if there's a, a form of censorship in place, then you're not going to do it whether it's the conservative censorship of speech that they don't like in the form of say pornography or uh, flag burning or whatever, then the U S Supreme court has come down as those are, those are forms of protected speech. For example, rock lyrics and these kind of things conservatives used to obsess about what people were doing or saying or expressing themselves as uh, But the uh, one reason I wrote the book uh, was because now it's kind of flipped. Now it's liberals that are being censorious and, you know, employing a cancel culture of anybody that doesn't toe the politically correct line uh, right down the you know, middle of the bell curve there of exactly what's acceptable speech. Wait a minute. You guys used to defend freedom of speech for the very reasons I just said back in the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. It didn't start to switch until really the early 2000s, I'd say, when the kind of postmodern movement took its extremist turn. Postmodernism by itself is not bad. I mean, the, the kind of skepticism employed against mainstream dogmatic worldviews is good. That's how we challenge uh, accepted wisdom to see if it's correct. You know, you have to be willing to do that. And that's how postmodernism originally began, which is fine. But then this kind of extreme form of, you know, now we know what the truths are and what the correct moral values are uh, established last Tuesday. And, you know, if you did something wrong 20 years ago, we're going to, you know, cancel you now. Um, you know, the goal there is not truth. It's to harm people. It's to destroy lives. And that really, um, really worries me um, that, you know, that, that liberals see a lot, uh, let's not call them liberals, let's call them illiberals. These are progressives. These are far left radical progressives or regressives, as some people call them, not liberals. True liberalism is that 
that commitment to free speech and, and diversity of thought um, for all the reasons I already said. So illiberalism of the far left and you know, to uh, this cancel culture of uh, deplatforming speakers, this obsession about microaggressions and safe spaces, all this that I've written about of what's gone on in the academy is very worrisome of all places. You know, university. This is the place where you're supposed to to enter to you know say anything you want. Just but uh, you know try different ideas and and usually you know by the time you leave home at 18 or so, and where you're starting to form your political, economic, ideological, religious beliefs and so forth, that's the time to explore and try out different ideas. And if you feel like well, if I say this, then I'm going to get in big trouble with my colleagues. Now I better just keep my mouth shut. You've you've lost the race right there, you know. And I ask students, and surveys uh, show this out that you know how many of you self censor. Everybody self censors. Now some self censorship makes sense. You know, you just you know walk around and just say whatever comes to your head. Uh, you know, hey, that's an ugly dress, or or you know, I can't stand your 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 hairstyle, or or you know whatever. You, you just keep your mouth shut because you don't want to, you know, you, it's not necessarily to uh, offend people for no good reason at all. That's different than self-censorship, like on a issue like abortion, uh, where I know the politically correct position, I'm supposed to be pro-choice. Okay. Uh, well, then when I ask my students, you know, what are the best arguments on the pro-life side? You know, most of them have no idea. You know, they, they, they've never even really talked to a pro-lifer before or at least they think they haven't, <laughs> you know, I tell them there, there's probably people in this room right now who are pro-life and you wouldn't know it. That's very bad that you don't know that because they're, they're afraid to say something. Why are they afraid to say something? Because you might try to cancel them. That's not good. You know, so I'm fond of saying, you know, I haven't watched some Ben Shapiro videos defending the pro-life position. Now I happen to be pro-choice. I think we have slightly better arguments, but only slightly, you know, the pro-life has good arguments. And, but, but the point is that the only way to find out what the arguments are is to be able to openly uh, discuss the, those issues. And there's a lot of issues like that. that are not clear. It's, it's completely legitimate to have a debate about immigration, tax rates, uh, you know, the affirmative action. These are all legitimate left, right, kind of standard debating topics that, you know, within, you know, the so-called Overton window, you know, that it's okay to discuss. And, uh, but that window is getting smaller and smaller where it's not okay. And that's worrisome. So the devil in this, in my book title, Giving the Devil His Due, is whoever disagrees with you about anything, which is pretty much going to be everybody because no one, no two people are perfectly aligned on every issue. Yeah, and, and one issue which we've seen very recently in society, uh, which I'd love to sort of get your thoughts on, is uh, Jordan Peterson. He's made his return back to sort of public life. He's not back in the mainstream media yet, but he just announced his latest book with Penguin Random House. Uh, you know, a sort of long story short for the people that don't know, um, you know, some of the employees sort of decided that, you know, a company that publishes Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler amongst, you know, other books, they sort of decided that they, they didn't want Penguin publishing Peterson's work. <laughs> so I would love to know, you know, what, what is your sort of thoughts? What's your sort of reaction to that incident? Yeah, I, I saw that Jordan tweeted out, please leave the employees of Penguin Random House alone. <laughs> uh, so to his credit, he's defending the people that, uh, that hate him. Okay, that takes that takes a lot of intellectual courage to be able to do that mm -hmm. and, and a spine, some fortitude. You know, he's quite open to being criticized. I've criticized him. I have a chapter in Giving the Devil His Due. Uh, the, the sec I think it's the last chapter, second to the last chapter anyway, that, um, you know, I, I agree with him on some points. I disagree with him on others. That's normal. You know, that's how it's supposed to be. And, you know, the principle of charity that is, take a charitable position towards somebody that they're not evil they're not hitler <laughs> and in any case back to the rules of conversation you know that you know no no not only no ad hominem no ad hitlerum you know the moment you <laughs> tell somebody that they're hitler the conversation's over you know no one thinks they're a nazi <laughs> or they're hitler right so in any case you know almost no one is so uh, you know, and Jordan's certainly not. He's, you know, he's a good guy. And he, he started off by asking me about Deepak. 
you know, I think he believes what he says. I, I agree. Uh, I would apply that to Jordan. You know, I think he believes what he says. I think he genuinely wants to help people. He is a clinical psychologist. Um, he thinks he has some ideas that will help people. And if you talk to the people at his um, public events, which I have, I've gone to a couple of them, you know, they seem to really genuinely get a lot out of his um, speeches and his books. And I read both of his books. I, uh, you know, the first one, uh, uh, Maps of Meaning, I found pretty impenetrable <laughs> for me anyway. And uh, I did it on audio and, you know, I gave up after about 15 hours. I, I just, I just couldn't do it. Uh, 12 Rules for Life, I thought was much better shorter maybe too long by half but still you know really good points in there basic stuff i mean most of his recommendations are in fact the kinds of things that cognitive behavioral psychologists do recommend as helpful for reducing anxiety uh, and stress for you know taking a more assertive um, uh, role in your life about you know getting raises and advancing your career and improving your relationships and friendships and family relationships and so on. And, uh, you know, most of that stuff is promoted by self-help gurus, you know, like Tony Robbins, these sorts of, you know, people that are in the trenches doing this. Most of what Jordan recommends is, you know, pretty much middle of the bell curve kind of stuff that, that most people think works pretty well for most people. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with that. Then the accusation, that you know he's a racist or a bigot or a misogynist you know i just don't see it i always ask people can you give me some examples and usually they have none or the few examples they have are so badly taken out of context it's like i don't think that's what he means when he says that and you know maybe sometimes he says things that are provocative in a in a way to stimulate conversation that's actually okay that's good you know a lot of a lot of philosophical thought experiments are designed to push your, um, your kind of boundaries or push your thinking to see how far and how well grounded your beliefs are. So when someone like Peter Singer, uh, you know, asks people to think about, you know, whether, uh, you know, we should keep alive disabled people or babies that are so severely disabled, that they'll never be able to even function. You know, people are horrified by this. You know, oh, you know, P Professor Singer thinks we should kill all handicapped people. No, this is not what he's doing. He he's, he's, he's kind of pushing you to think how well grounded are your moral principles? You'd say they're Christian principles or whatever. Uh, you know, how, how, how well have you thought that out? Are you a utilitarian? Are you a Kantian deontological? moralist, what, what, what are, most people have never even thought about these things, but, you know, it's sort of the point of, of a philosopher is to get you to at least think about these things, regardless of what position you end up taking. And so uh, I think Jordan does some of that, um, you know, like the, the famous one where it was something about should women wear makeup at work, you know, and, you know, that's just a mind trap. I would not even answer the question, but, you know, to his credit, he, you know, he had the spine to say, well, maybe we should think about that. Whoa. Now, of course, he's immediately called a massage. All he said was, maybe we should think about that or talk about that or whatever the exact words were. You know, he wasn't, you know, taking a position like women should never wear makeup at work because it sexualizes them and it gets men all heated up or, you know, whatever. You know, from there, you know, it's like, well, are you saying they should wear the burqa, you know? And it's just, again, I think a lot of that with Jordan is, is just like Peter Singer. Let, let, let's just think about these things and see how far we, we can go with that. Yeah, and I think there's a, a real value in that. And, you know, I wouldn't say I, I know Jordan super well. I wouldn't call him a close friend or anything like that. But I know him well enough to know I, I think he's uh, a man of character and honesty and integrity. And, and he believes what he says and he really wants to make a difference. And he does make a difference in people's lives. And, you know, that he's had personal problems. So what? I mean, everybody has personal problems that kind of humanizes him. And, uh, you know, it's just the way it goes. Hopefully we'll see him on the skeptic platform in the uh, the coming months. I'll keep my fingers crossed. Oh, for sure. Crossed. I I will, I will read his his new book. Oh, what bothered back to the employees? Yeah, what bothered me about that, mm -hmm. and I I admit I, I kind of jumped in on the pylon. Uh, <laughs> I tweeted something like translated uh, books that I agree with. That is to say, they were they were praising Penguin Random House for publishing, you know, books in support of LGBTQ people and so forth. Uh, 
but now it all appears to be performative. This word performative, where they get these words is too, it's too funny. Performative. In other words, Penguin Random House was just performing the act of supporting LGBTQ, but they don't really believe it because look, they just uh, agreed to publish Jordan Peterson. You mean to say, well, first of all, you know, Penguin Random House is a for-profit corporation, a major one, and they have to make money. That's their number one task. So there's nothing wrong with publishing, you know, people on both sides of an issue and making money on, in both cases. That's that's totally normal uh, in the business world. They're not a nonprofit. If you want to work for a nonprofit, go work for a nonprofit. But it's not going to be Penguin Random House, okay? And second of all, the, but by saying what they did, they're kind of saying, well, they should publish books that I agree with, you know. And these are usually like English majors just out of college, okay? What do you know? I mean, really, you know, you've you've determined what the truth is on these eternal moral issues at the age of 23, you know, and there's no more debate. You know, the standards that were set last Tuesday, that's it. That's the truth. Are you sure? You know, and they're the ones, if anything, that need to read Jordan Peterson. <laughs> I love it, man. I got two questions for you left. One question I'd love to know is that I know that you describe yourself as an optimist. I'd love to know. So do you still find yourself sort of optimistic in the world today with, you know, so much tribalism and, and just sheer lunacy, for lack of a better world in the world today? I am because uh, at age 66, I've seen uh, a lot of this come and go over the decades. Uh, it seems worse now because in part the recency effect is happening now. Uh, internet has, you know, made it more apparent in your face every hour on the hour. You know, every time I log into Twitter, it's like, oh my God, I can't, I got to stop scrolling down. Stop, stop, Shermer. Go out and ride your bike. Go read your book. Go work on something. <laughs> um, you know, so that, that obviously drives it. Um, but, you know, if you go back to, uh, you know, 1968 and the Vietnam War and then Nixon, Watergate, all that craziness, you know, I mean, th th things are not crazier now. They just, I think, seem like it. That said, you know, I, I, I am a, a realist, a realistic optimist in the sense that there is moral progress. Things really, truly are better in more places for more people more of the time. Uh, that's true. And we still have issues, you know, so now I've kind of undertaken a new project of reading a lot of these um, books related to the BLM movement. So I just finished Cast by Isabel Wilkins, Wil Wil Wilkerson, uh, an African-American uh, journalist for the New York Times who wrote, um, her first book was uh, The Warmth of Other Sons about the migration of blacks out of the South to the North during Jim Crow. And her new book is about uh, making the analogy between the Indian caste system and the American caste system, and then the, her third model is the German, Nazi Germany, and Jews as a caste system. I think these are three different things, uh, but I wanted to take get her take on it, and she had a lot of, it's anecdote driven rather than data driven, so this always worries me, because um, she piles up example after example after example of of this kind of caste discrimination. So here she is, an African-American journalist for the New York Times, and she shows up at, at uh, some uh, corporate CEO's office to interview him for a story for the New York Times. And he comes out and says, uh, yes, can I help you? Oh, I'm, I'm here, to inter uh, here to interview. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do any more interviews right now. I'm waiting for my big interview with the New York Times. He goes, that's me. No, no, you don't understand. This journalist from the New York Times is coming in. She goes, that's me. You know, so he's white guy staring at a black woman and the message is apparent. He can't see that a black woman could be a journalist for the New York Times, right? So, and you know, so just multiply that by a hundred in the book. And it, there's enough of that that it worries me. Like, crap, man, you know, maybe things are not as good as, you know, I've kind of thought they were. And I'm, you know, middle-aged white guy and middle-class and I, I don't experience stuff like that. So what do I know, right? So I'm trying to be open to that and, uh, and yet I still think, you know, the moment you set up a belief model, back to where we started with the believing brain, you know, America is a racist caste system. You're going to see everything that happens through that lens and think, boy, we are a racist caste system. Things are, things are as bad as they've ever been. Well, no, they're not as bad as they, they'd ever been. And if I could ask her a question, my first question would be, you know, you are one of the best-selling authors in America today. 
two of her books were on yesterday's New York Times bestseller list. You know, she writes for the New York Times, right? She's been a professor. If if the uh, racial caste system is so oppressive, how did you, how did you do this? You do <laughs> Apparently, you can do this despite the caste system. And and then the other thing I also read had, had previously read um, um, uh, J.D. Vance's book uh, "Hillbilly Elegy." about what it's like to grow up in this kind of deep, uh, in this case in Ohio, kind of deep hillbilly country uh, where, you know, it's doubtful that they've ever even seen a black, much less known a black person. You know, race is not an issue. This is a different issue. This is a class issue that, and you read that and you think, wow, I, you know, the power of class to determine people's lives, you know, so then you get, go down the rabbit hole of income inequality and all that, that makes a huge difference. How is that a racial caste system? You know, like the 1619 Project, everything in America is about race. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, now if you're an economist and you're a liberal economist and you're worried about income inequality, everything that happens is not race, it's class, it's income, it's money. It's the rigged unfair system of class, not race, you know? So again, I think these are all interesting perspectives. I wanna read them, uh, but uh, I always uh, caution you know, don't oversimplify uh, a, an explanatory causal model of some human action you're interested in looking at, police brutality or crime rates or, or, or whatever, um, out of wedlock births and whatnot. You know, the model you set up to, to uh, study it is gonna probably determine what you find. That doesn't make it true. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know we, we have to be careful not to overdetermine things like that. Yeah, and in this book, the Believe in Brain, as well as in your other work, you make this fantastic case about the confirmation bias and whatnot. I have absolutely loved chatting with you today, Dr. Schumer. My last question to you, and then please tell these guys where you can, where they can find you, other projects, about wherever you'd like to direct them. Oh, sure. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my last question for you today is, what makes a life worth living? Oh boy. <laughs> okay. Well, that's the last chapter of my book, uh, Heavens on Earth. I kind of dealt with that issue because I'm an atheist and I don't think there's an afterlife. Uh, it's, th it's this life uh, that counts. And, and even if there is an afterlife, it doesn't really matter. We don't live there and then. We live here and now. So either way, uh, what you do here is what matters. And, and by that, I mean um, okay, let me reflect on this for a moment. You know, so I, I'm a psycho. I have a degree in psychology. You know, until the late '90s, psychology mostly studied negative things about uh, human action and, and thought. You know, depression and anxiety and suicide and drug addiction and war, violence, crime. You know, all the bad things. And so the happiness movement, the kind of positive psychology movement, was really welcome. Because, you know, it's like, well, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, happy. They're not, they're not criminals. And they're, they're not violent. And they, they're not depressed. They're not suicidal. So what do we know about them? Nothing. Okay, let's study them. The problem, though, there is, uh, you know, now there's been, you know, hundreds of books on happiness and thousands of research papers. It isn't happiness. I think that's the wrong word. And now there's kind of a push against that, that it's more for more like meaningfulness, purposefulness is what matters because the word happiness conveys this idea that you're walking around with a big smile on your face and you just feel glowingly good all the time well frankly i don't feel that way most of the time and i don't want to feel that way most of the time i want to challenge myself and push myself and that requires not feeling happy and glowy but you know like stressed anxious and uh, you know and so the analogy i use in my book is that you know I was a caretaker for two of my four parents. My parents were divorced when I was young and was raised by, um, you know, step parents as well as my bio parents. So, and, you know, as they got older, uh, you know, two of them uh, died and then, uh, and then two of them lived a long, slow declining life. And, you know, so I was caretaker for them. This was not fun. I did not have a good time doing this, schlepping my dad around to hospitals and, and the doctor's offices and, and nursing homes. And it, it was, you know, depressing. It was stressful. I was physically exhausted at the end of the day, you know, helping my dad, but I felt like a better person for it. Like, uh, you know, I would want somebody that loved me to do this for me. And this is what life is all about, you know, is fa a family and friendship and love. 
uh, it's about doing the kind of things you you're not happy doing, or you're not it's not you're not having fun doing it. Or on a more simplistic level, you know, working out, I ride my bike every day for a couple hours. I wouldn't say it's fun in a in a kind of oh boy, I'm feeling so good. You know, a lot of the time it's stressful and it's hard. But, you know, I feel better afterwards, like uh, getting a workout. This is what it takes to keep growing in life. And anyway, uh, so I would say the emphasis now that a lot of psychologists are moving toward uh, the study of a purposeful life, you know, that, and, and what we know now is like having meaningful work, a reason to get out of bed in the morning, get out of the house and get out and do something productive, having meaningful friendships, having a loving relationship of any kind, having family. Uh, and doing things that take you out of yourself, you know, working for a charity or a nonprofit or volunteering or helping people that you, well, you don't get anything out of it. Uh, you know, those are the kind of things that, you know, make people feel better about themselves. Like I had a good life, more long term thinking than short term thinking, you know, having dinner and drinks with friends tonight. That'll be fun, but it's over tomorrow. It, maybe instead, maybe instead of doing that every night, I'll do every other night. I'll, I'll read a book, or I'll, I'll study something, or I'll work out, or something that you know, in years down the line, to make me a better person. That kind of long-term thinking is what people say gives them more purpose and meaningfulness in their lives. And finally, spirituality. I have to say something because I'm an atheist about this, and I'm you know, pretty critical of religion. But you know, something like a spiritual life, whatever that means. Back to Deepak Chopra, it could be meditation, it could be just kind of reflecting on life itself while you're walking barefoot on the beach, <laughs> something like that. Or you know, dance or hiking or or, or you know, again meditation or in my case, long you know slow bike rides that are you know that I kind of just think to myself or uh, reflect on things, anything like that, um, that gets people out of them, their immediate day-to-day -day self and into this kind of more reflective self, that seems to make a big difference in people's lives. <coughs> anyway, I hope that answered your question. <laughs> I, I love that answer. Man, can you tell, point these guys in any directions to any of your work that you'd like to share with them? Oh, yeah. So, uh, right. So skeptic.com is the webpage for the magazine and, and the society. We're a nonprofit and uh, our, our mission is science education. So if you support that, then, then you can support us there. Uh, my books, you know, are, Amazon, of course, is the place to go these days since, you know, book, bookstores are, 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 are getting harder to get, get into. Uh, and uh, michaelshermer.com is my, you know, homepage that my Wikipedia page has a lot on there. And anyway, so that's, that's basically it. Skeptic.com is the first place to go.